biological information, reverse conservation. Uh, I chose that title because conservation implies that it never goes down. This is, if you go backwards in history, it never goes down. Or to say it in reverse, it never goes up. Uh, this is part of the book, uh, Biological Information, uh, New Perspectives. It was edited by several people who are well known in the uh, intelligent design movement. Uh, it's published by World uh, Scientific Publishing Company. Um, in 2013, it's uh, Proceedings of a Symposium held in 2011, and they were actually ready to publish in 2012 until the boycott hit. And all of the chapters can be found at the website that I have outlined. Um, that's what the book looks like. I have my own personal copy. Um, yeah, I spent the money. And the reason I did it was because I wanted to support the uh, group. Um, the book is divided into a general introduction and then three major parts, biological information and genetic theory, which is what we're uh, talking about now, theoretical molecular biology, and finally biological information and self-organizational complexity theory. Um, it has people um, who are atheists on it. This is not a uh, this is not a theological book, but it is a book uh, by people who feel that uh, the mathematics just won't work for uh, the standard neo-Darwinian random variations and natural selection. Um, this particular chapter is entitled A General Theory of Information Cost Incurred by Successful Search. I'll abbreviate that a little bit. It's by William Dembski, Winston Ewart, and Robert Marks. Those of you who w looked at the movie Expelled, Dembski and Marx both appeared in it. Winston Ewart is apparently a graduate student, um, although I think an older one. And um, they, Dembski is with the Discovery Unit uh, in Institute, and uh, Robert Marx is with uh, Baylor University. The abstract goes, this paper provides a general framework for understanding targeted search. It begins by defining the search matrix, which makes explicit the sources of information that can affect search progress. The search matrix enables a search to be represented as a probability measure on the original search space. <coughs> this representation facilitates tracking the information cost incurred by successful search, success being defined as finding the target. To categorize such costs, various information and efficiency measures are defined, notably active information. Conservation of information characterizes these costs and is precisely formulated via two theorems. One restricted, which was proved in previous works that they have done. The other general, proved for the first time here. The restricted version assumes a uniform probability search baseline. Um, Everything is evenly developed. The general, an arbitrary probability search baseline. When a search with probability Q of success displaces a baseline search with probability P of success, where Q is greater than P, a con conservation of information states that raising the probability of successful uh, search by a factor of Q over P, how, how uh, much better you want the search to be, incurs an information cost of at least log Q over P. That's log 2 for those of you who are wondering about that. Conservation of information shows that information, like money, obeys strict accounting principles. But kind of like money, it's easy to lose it. It's a lot harder to earn it. Information cost incurred by search. The search matrix, all but the most trivial searches are needle in the haystack problems. Yet many searches successfully locate needles in haystacks. How is this possible? 
A successful search locates a target in a manageable number of steps. Uh, remember, these people, particularly Marx is a computer scientist. Uh, that's his mathematical background. According to Conservation of Information, non-trivial searches can be successful only by drawing on existing external information, outputting no inf more information than was inputted. And this is the reference to their own previous work. In previous work, we made assumptions that limited the generality of cons conservation of information, such as assuming that the baseline against which search performance is evaluated must be a uniform probability distribution, or that any query of the search space yields full knowledge of whether the candidate queried is inside or outside the target. In this paper, we remove such constraints and show that conservation of information holds quite generally. We continue to assume the targets are fixed. Search for fuzzy and movable targets will be the object of future research by the Evolutionary Informatics Lab. So they're not done yet, but um, they, now, they now have relaxed some of the constraints on their original theorem so that you can, um, uh, that it covers more searches and then fuzzy and movable targets will be added later on. In generalizing conservation of information, we, search gen we first generalize what we mean by targeted search. The first three sections of this paper, therefore, develop a general approach to targeted search. The upshot of this approach is that any search may be represented as a probability distribution on the space being searched. Readers who are prepared to accept that searches may be represented in this way can skip to section four and regard the first three sections as stage setting. Um, we'll go a little bit into them because one, they're probably one of the more interesting parts of the paper, and two, um, they are uh, uh, one of the more understandable parts of the paper uh, if you're reading rapidly. Nevertheless, we suggest that readers study these first these sections if only to appreciate the full generality of the approach to search that we are proposing and also to understand why attempts to circumvent conservation of information via certain types of searches fail. Indeed, as we shall see, such attempts to bypass conservation of information look to searches that fall under the general approach outlined here. Moreover, conservation of information is formalized here applies to all these cases. If you don't know what you're looking for, you're not likely to find it, basically. In the first generalized targeted search before generalizing conservation of information, we introduce the search matrix. The elements that constitute the search matrix may be illustrated as followed. Imagine a gigantic table that has miles in both length and width. Covering the table are upside down Dixie cups that are tightly packed, such as the following hexagonal packing. Um, I think that's actually pills that they have hexagonally packed, but, but it gives you an idea of what they're talking about. Everything is packed as tight as you can in there. That's as close as you can get. Well, you can measure, you know, row and column. The columns will, or the rows, the columns will be slanted one way or the other, but you can give every Dixie cup a number. Under each Dixie cup resides a single P. The cups are opaque, so the peas are not visible unless the cup is lifted. The peas come in two varieties, high yield and low yield. The difference being that high yield peas, if planted, produce lots of peas, whereas low yield peas produce only a few, or perhaps none at all. Um, the low yield peas far outnumber the high yield peas. Our task is to locate a high yield pea. The high yield peas, therefore, form the target. And immediately you're going to say, well, how do you tell the difference? Well, that's one of the points they're going to raise. And that's why they're making it, this is a generalized search. In fact, one of the, one of the searches will be, you lift it up and you can't tell whether it's high yield or low yield. In which case, you might as well just pick one at random and use it. Because the table is so large and the cups are tightly packed, for a human to try to walk around the table, remember this is Miles, uh, and turn over the cups is infeasible. We therefore imagine a remote controlled toy helicopter flying over the table, hovering over individual cups and lifting a given cup to examine the pea under it, or maybe a skyhook, whatever. 
Each act of lifting a cup to examine the P under it constitutes a single query. A query asking a question. And I'm not going to read this all the way through. And where you see dots, you can assume that there are omissions. And occasionally, at the end of paragraphs, there'll be omission of another paragraph. I try to indicate mo them most of the time, but I'm not sure I was totally successful in that. Within the constraints of this scenario, how do we find the target? The helicopter has M queries in which to locate the target. That is to find a high yield P. At each query, the helicopter does three things. It, one, identifies a given P by removing and replacing the Dixie cup under it, so you can look at the P. Two, it extracts information that bears on the P's probability of belonging to the target. Uh, it gets DNA, I don't know, it gets, uh, it looks at the color, maybe a green versus yellow, who knows. And it, it receives information for deciding where to fly next to examine the next P. So you get over there, you lift up the cup, you look at it, and then you move on to the next. Uh, think of this as somebody instructing a computer program. Go to row such and such, column such and such, look under that cup. Um, the helicopter search for the target may therefore be characterized as the following three by M matrix, which we call the search matrix. And, and this is an example of a standard search matrix. It, it'll have, um, look at the characteristics as alpha, move to the next one as beta, and this one will be uh, basically where do you go. It looks like you simply look at it and then move and then decide. Um, here, the first row lists the actual P's sampled. The second row lists the information extracted about the P's that bear on their probability of belonging to the car target. And the third row lists the information for deciding where the helicopter is to fly next. The search matrix is not identical with the search. Rather, the search matrix records key information about the progress of the search. The search matrix is basically the instructions for the search, and sometimes the instructions will change mid-round depending on what you find under the Dixie cup. All this information contained in the search matrix comes to light through the activity of a search algorithm. Success of the search therefore depends on how effectively the algorithm uses as well as fills in the information contained in the search matrix. And there are search matrices that remember everything you've ever done, and there are search matrices that only remember the very last one you went to. Um, and there are ones that vary in between that and that might vary, uh, that might do base 100 searches based on one particular, uh, uh, in which case they can be 100 searches at the same time, but, you, but they're listed in order because um, mathematically it doesn't matter whether you do them all at once or one at a time. Uniform random sampling with perfect knowledge. In this case, each X sub I is selected according to a uniform distribution across, across the Dixie cups. It says it's random. It, you just, you know, oh, row 100 this time, row 365 next time, and columns distributed in that same kind of way. Um, each alpha 1 records whether X1 belongs to the target, one for yes, zero for no, and you know. And each beta one directs the helicopter to take a uniform random sample and locating the next point in the search space, that being X of I plus one. The reference to perfect knowledge here signifies that for each query, we know exactly whether the P sample, each X, belongs to the target, in which case A sub i equals 1, or not, in which case a sub i equals 0. For example, let's supposing that there aren't that many p's actually, and you lift it up and it's empty. Well, that one's not going to grow. Um, and all of the p's are good for growing 
whatever. So all you really have to do is just lift up and look and is there a P there? And if the P's there, it's one, and if the P's not there, it's zero. Um, if any A sub I equals one, we can stop the search. Oh, we found a P, we're done. A successful search. Alternatively, we can fill out the search matrix. In other words, well, once we get that P, we can just keep lifting up that same Dixie cup because we know the P's in there. Um, and mathematically, those are identical responses. Given that the probability of high yield P's, that is the target, has probability P, uh, I don't know whether they were thinking of that pun or not, uh, the probability that the search is successful is 1 minus 1 minus p to the m, um, which is kind of interesting because that um, 1 minus p to the m is of a form that if m and p are sufficiently large, starts to look like um, an exponential function. Um, and in other words, it invites uh, success of a logarithmic type. Uniform random sampling with zero knowledge. In this case, as before, each x sub i, and I should have put that as a sub, I missed that one, is selected according to a uniform distribution across the Dixie cups. This time, however, examining the p's reveals nothing about whether they belong to the target. This might happen, for example, for instance, if high yield and low yield peas are visually indistinguishable. Some of them are sterile. Some of them are not. Um, and we have no way of otherwise discriminating them, as we might through genetic analysis or actually planting them. Accordingly, a sample size of m greater than 1 does nothing here to improve on the probability of locating the target if we have no means of obtaining knowledge about the peas we are sampling. You lift one up, you lift one up, you lift one up. You have no idea whether you hit a P or not. So your only options are either to collect all P's or if you're required to use only one P, you might as well just lift up one at random. Example 1.3, uniform random sampling with partial knowledge. And I'm going to skip over that because there are a lot of things that, um, uh, that you can go into such as well, you look at the P and let's say you can tell whether it's yellow or green, but you don't know for sure whether the yellow or green ones um, are better at growing. But you think the yellow ones are probably not as good or maybe probably better. Example 1.4, smooth gradient fitness with single peak. And um, there's a section on that as well. And that, by the way, is the model that most evolutionists like to believe that life exists on Earth, is that there's gradual increase in fitness. Every single mutation makes it a little better. And that, you, that makes it real easy to find a search space. You simply go uh, around the area that you're in, and you take the best one, and then go around the area that you're in, and you take the best one, and so forth. Um, that, by the way, yes? Um, Maybe you can help me here because I'm a little bit lost. Um, when you talk about conservation, you started out with conservation of information. Right. Exactly what is that? Because when I started thinking about that, you were, I, I, I kind of thought of a tape recorder erasing this tape and I lost the tape. I mean, I understand the um, conservation of energy or matter, but, but what do you mean by conservation of information? That's why I started out with the title of reverse conservation. Uh, so you're, you're not arguing for it, you're just It can to be lost, it can't be gained. And we're going to find out, uh, at least what they're going to claim eventually, is that you can't get more information than what you put in to begin with. Okay. Now, now so follow, follow the argument 
and then we'll see how we get there. As I said, if there are special cases, you can actually turn something loose and you can get more information than you started out with, except that you have to have the information that this is a smooth, uh, uh, with, n with no extra hills in it to get stuck in. And you, you have to have the information that, uh, that a targeted search of a particular kind will get you where you want to go. Okay, now the concept of a search, um, it's a little too abstract for me. I'm trying to, trying to can you widen that out a little bit? I mean, I, I'm thinking about a query in a computer program right. or something like that. Right. But what does that have to do with numbers, so to speak? Well, imagine, instead of Dixie Cups, imagine yourself with a whole array with scattered ones in the middle of zeros. Which, which aren't random, they're the truth, right? That's well, the they're the truth. Maybe they're random, maybe they're not, and you don't know ahead of time. Okay. Now, how do you go hunting? Yeah, how do you do that? Because there's a lot of interpretation to ask. Well, see, it's to. really nice to have an oracle that says there's a one right here. And then when you do, you, find, you make your first search there. If you miss it, you try maybe the area around it to make sure you didn't you know, accidentally miss it. But that requires extra knowledge. There's a one in that spot. OK, so the, the more you information you get, the more you can predict where the That's right. Be. That's right. It, okay. This this the basic principle is you can't uh, there is no really good way of cheating. Um, that nothing outperforms a random search unless it has extra information in it. And uh, if you wanted to put this whole thing in a nutshell, that's probably what you'd say. Okay. Example uh, 1.4, smooth gradient fitness with single peak. And we talked about that. And then general targeted search. Um, a precise mathematical characteristic of the general search scenario described in the last section. The, the lines in this six tuple, and they, they have a whole bunch of mathematical notations which I've omitted for you, describe, uh, denote as respectively the initiator, the terminator, the inspector, the navigator, the nominator, and the discriminator. And we're going to go into those now. Here's what they mean. The initiator starts the ball rolling. You've got to start somewhere, um, and you have to have some kind of principle. Do you start at 1, 1? Do you start at the end? Do you start at the other corner? Do you start smack in the middle? Or do you just kind of pick one at random and go with it? The terminator provides a stop criterion for ending the search. Because all searches are limited to a maximum number of queries M, the terminator can uh, always simply be identified with the policy to cut off the search after M queries. In practice, however, terminators often end a search because the search is deemed to have achieved success before this maximal number. Oh, we hit a one. Why go any further? We've got it. The <laughs> inspector, OU, or O alpha, I'm sorry, is an oracle that in querying a search space entry extracts information bearing on its probability of belonging to the target T. It looks at the P. It says, is this a good P? Now, O alpha may even assume misleading values, suggesting that search space entries are in the target when they are not, and vice versa. So supposing that your prior knowledge says the green peas are better than yellow peas, but actually the yellow peas are better than green peas, then you, when you hit a green pea, you're going to think, oh, I've got it. When you hit a yellow pea, you're going to think, no, nope, no, nope, can't be this one. So unless you have some kind of an oracle that can tell you, yes, this is the right one, and it's an appropriate oracle, you're in danger of actually misleading yourself in the search. Like the inspector O alpha, the navigator O beta is an oracle. 
it basically tells you if you've got this pattern, well, we should look over here now. The navigator takes this partial search matrix, the stuff we've already filled out, and returns the value beta sub i, which directs or navigates the search as it attempts to locate the next entry in the search space, that is, x sub i plus 1. Now, the, the nominator fancy a is the update rule that given a, a search matrix filled through the ith column and thus incorporating the most current information from the inspector and navigator explicitly identifies and thereby nominates the next element to be queried, namely x sub i plus 1. That sounds to me an awful lot like the um, um, like the inspector, uh, pardon me, the navigator. I'm not sure. Uh, it seems to me like maybe I could put it this way, that to me the uh, nominator is incorporates the navigator. The navigator is just, uh, the nominator actually goes there. The navigator says, well, you should go there next. Once a search matrix that's compatible with fancy A has been formed, it's time to decide which X sub I that appears in the first row is most likely to belong to the target T. The target T has T, uh, T uh, good P's in a, a universe of N good and bad P's, and the probability of finding a, a P is simply T over N from a total random search perspective. For the search to be successful, we need to know which of these entries in fact belongs to T, or if definite knowledge of inclusion in T is not possible, then which of these entries is more likely than the rest to belong to T? Like, for example, half the yellow ones grow, none of the green ones grow. You find a yellow one, uh, then you probably want to stick with it. Information costs incurred by search. Discriminators can vary in, quali uh, in quality. Self-defeating discriminators that, whenever possible, select first row entries belonging outside the target are an option because you don't know what you're looking for ahead of time. Also an option are independent knowledge discriminators that can identify whether a first row entry belongs to the target with greater certainty than is possible simply on the basis of the information delivered by the inspector and the navigator. For example, you happen to know that all of the real good ones are right in the center. Well, you might go to the center deliberately selecting that. And that's knowledge that's independent of whether you picked up peas and looked at them and saw whether they uh, were any good or not. Search examples. In this section, we consider several further examples of targeted search, expanding on the examples given at the end of section one. So well, we've seen these before. Uniform random samples with perfect knowledge and without replacement. Um, if n is much larger than m, this probability approximately equals the with replacement probability 1 minus 1 minus p to the m. Again, that is a standard log form. Um, uh, underscoring the well-known fact that sampling without replacement only negligibly improves the efficiency of search compared with sampling with replacement unless the sample size m is large. If you think about it, what it means is that if you randomly pick one and you randomly pick another one, the chances of you randomly picking the first one again are so small as to be ignored if the search space is big enough. Um, and the, they give the example of the Easter egg hunt, which is the classic evolutionary scenario. They give example of competitive search. Just what constitutes the right balance of performance criteria is not written in stone but constitutes a judgment call. S consider a search space consisting of all college men's basketball players in a given year. Professional NBA teams are seeking the best basketball players in this search place. 
And I might add outside of the search place too, because if there's somebody playing in Yugoslavia, they want them as well. Um, <coughs> Uh, the very best, presumably being the player picked first in the first round of the NBA draft. But what determines the best players? M many performance criteria come to mind. Speed, height, field goal percentage, three-point percentage, average number of rebounds per game, average number of block shots per game, average number of assists per game, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and I might add that in this particular case, the needs of the one team who just lost their star center might be somebody who's taller and not so, not so well, whereas somebody who's lost their point guard might want somebody smaller but faster and shoots better. So uh, it, it depends not only on, on uh, the various combinations you have, what you'd really like to have is Magic Johnson who can play everything including guard and, and center. But, you know, there aren't always Magic Johnsons. But more importantly, if you lost a center and you really want a center, you get one of them. If you want a point guard, then you may not, you may have to, uh, uh, you, you may make do with somebody who's much smaller but uh, much faster and better shot. A college admissions officer is now doing a search for high school students to to go to his college or her college. The Scholastic Aptitude Test uh, is one of the criteria you could use. A verb and math score, each varying between 200, which is worst, and 800, which is best. Uh, with these, well, what do you do if somebody's 400 and 400, somebody is somebody's 500 and 300, which one are you going to pick? You know. Um, with these two queries, performed on each high school student, how do you now select the best students for your school? L and it might vary. At MIT, they want more science, perhaps. At uh, some other places, they want more uh, verbal. How do you select the best students for your school? Leaving aside other performance criteria, such as GPA and recommendations. Example 3.4 is tournament play, and they, one of the examples they give is here's St. Petersburg in 1909. Who's the best player? Well, is it Rubenstein, who gets 14.5 points, or is it Lasker, who gets 14.5 points? It depends on whether you value not losing more, in which case Rubenstein wins, or uh, uh, Winning and losing is more, uh, winning more games is more important even if you lost one more, in which case Lasker wins. Rubenstein plays for ties. Um, or perhaps is it the person who beats the best players, in which case uh, does Chatmirsky beat both of the top two people? He didn't beat too many other people. Interesting question. Um, information cost incurred by search. Population search. For some searches, the concern is not simply with individuals exhibiting certain characteristics, but with whole populations exhibiting these characteristics. Thus, in population genetics, the emergence of a trait in a lone individual is not enough. Traits can come and go within a population. The point of interest is whether a trait gets fixed enough, when a trait gets fixed enough among members of a population to take hold and perpetuate. And information and efficiency measures. In a general theory of search that avoids arbitrary assumptions about underlying probability distributions, uniform probabilities no nonetheless play a salient role. To take a single uniform variate from the search space omega will be called the null search. That is, you, you try one time, you pick it randomly, and that's your answer. That's the null search. This search becomes the baseline against which we compare all other searches, which he calls alternative searches. In comparing null and alternative searches, it is convenient to convert probabilities to information measures. Note that all logarithms in the SQL um, 
r to the base 2. We therefore define endogenous information as log <coughs> minus log p. We def uh, define the exogenous information as log q. And finally, we define the active information, that's the difference between the two, i plus, as the, as, uh, the difference between the exogenous and uh, endogenous and exogenous information, that is to say log p q over p. Uh, information being, uh, being measured by a log of bits is standard. Active information therefore measures the information that must be added, hence the plus sign, on top of a null search to raise an alternative search's probability of success by a factor of Q over P. Liftings and lowerings. Conserva conservation of information tracks the information that goes into constructing a search. Showing that the amount of information exhibited by the search in locating a target can never exceed the amount of information inputted in its construction. Proposition 5.1, let's see, that was, ah, um, consistency of uniformity, and we're going to skip over some of that. Uh, conservation of information, the uniform case. We are now in a position to pro prove two conservation of information theorems. The special case for uniform probabilities, which we have proved elsewhere and recap here in this section, and the general case for arbitrary probabilities, which we prove for the first time in the next section. We begin with the special case. Um, let T be a target in omega. That's, omega is this kind of the search space. Assuming omega is finite and T is not empty, let U develop, uh, denote the uniform probability distribution on omega and let P equal the absolute value of T over the absolute value of Q equals UT, which we take to be extremely small. Next, let mu be a probability distribution on omega such that Q equals mu times t, which we take to be considerably larger than p. Suppose that mu characterizes the probabilistic behavior of an alternate search S, so that the endogenous, in other words, not a single search, so that the endogenous information is i omega equals log p, and the exogenous information is i, that should be sub S, I miss putting that down, equals minus log q. Then the higher order uniform probability of T sub Q in um, uh, M of omega denoted by U of T sub Q is less than or equal to P over Q. Note that it is not greater than. You don't gain information is the point. And just so you can see, yes, they did a bunch of hairy math. And um, if you want to analyze it, you better go to the book and look at it carefully. Uh, conservation of information is essentially an accounting rule for probabilities associated with search. Here's how it works. Finding the original target P within T, uh, T within Omega had the very low probability of P under the null search. Fortunately, an alternative search was available to raise this probability to Q. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, but the probability cost of locating this alternative search represented by mu was less than or equal to P over Q. Thus, when the cost of locating the alternative search is factored in, how do we know it's going to work? Uh, or how do we think that it's going to work? Um, nothing is gained over the original null search that wasn't put in to begin with. The original search, as it were, uh, purchased the target at the high probability cost P. The alternative search correspondingly purchased the target at the cheaper probability cost Q, but then itself incurred a probability cost of at least P over Q in a higher order search space, since the alternative search itself had to be accounted for. 
Thus, when the full probability cost incurred by the alternative search are factored in, the total cost is the same as, or even worse than, the probability cost associated with the original null search. Conservation of information, the general case. Um, theorem 7.1, conservation of information, and the general case has its own wild and hairy math. Uh, which keeps going, but finally comes down to, notice that greater is less than or equal sign and then, uh, and then another is less than or equal sign. So you can never get more than what you put in. Regulating the information industry, that's, this is an interesting comment and I'm not sure exactly what it's supposed to mean, except that perhaps um, Regulating um, should be done as a as a theoretical thing rather than as a uh, rather than calling in the government to regulate it. Conservation of information supplies the information industry with a balance sheet, ensuring that the information output on one side of the ledger does not exceed the information input on the other. Regulation of the financial industry is necessary because it is too easy to mask liabilities as assets and thereby attempt to escape one's obligations. Likewise, res regulation of the information industry is necessary because it is too easy to focus on the success of a search and forget the information that paid for that success. The temptation is to inflate the creative power of search programs by conveniently forgetting the creative power of the programmers who impart the information that makes those programs successful. In short, the temptation is to ignore observa conservation of information in the hopes of a free lunch, information speaking. Conservation of information keeps the search practitioner honest. Now, that's the paper. My own take is this is a mathematically rigorous proof, or pretty close to it anyway, that one cannot get more information out of a search program than one put in. It basically mathematically reaffirms the garbage in, garbage out principle that's well known in computer science. It shows that we can basically ignore claims that non-targeted simple computer programs in random noise can produce information and suggests that random noise and natural selection cannot create the various forms of life. It is not likely to settle the evolution controversy. For one thing, there are too many theological points in the way. One can always claim that natural selection is a hill climbing process and that life exhibits smooth hills that can be climbed using this method. And if life were arranged that way, those, those objections would be appropriate. Uh, it does raise the interesting question of was that whole thing designed to begin with, but backing up on that, it does raise the question of whether all or even most of biology can be reduced to smooth hill climbing. And as we've talked about before, this is an area of legitimate inquiry, but I think the available evidence suggests that life is not, in fact, all smooth hills, in which case the climbing uh, paradigm is the wrong paradigm. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. I got one question. Sure. Um, do you think that this is a criticism of evolution or a criticism of the thinking of evolution? I, I think it's a criticism of a certain approach to evolution. Uh, you, so there's more than one approach to evolution? Oh, I think so. Uh, I think that there is... Some might be good. Uh, well, some of them might be, uh, what I see, uh, what I see people trying to do, uh, if I were making the comment, is that um, you have people saying, well, it's neutral evolution, and neutral evolution can get change. What neutral evolution has a hard time doing is getting progress. Neutral evolution does not explain fine-tuning. That's explained by either design, somebody knew what they were doing and deliberately put it that way, 
or else um, natural selection and um, and, and random variations. And the problem with natural selection and random variations is you have to assume that there's a smooth hill. And there's a number of papers, uh, Durston in, uh, or pardon me, Axton in particular, Axton, um, uh, Gager, uh, where they looked at how far apart uh, enzymes were that did different jobs that are in the same general uh, family. And it turns out that even there, where it's pretty close and you ought to be able to see it, um, there isn't a smooth hill where you can climb from one to the other without losing function. Um, that it's not only far, it's not only not a smooth hill, but uh, there's enough of a valley in between that you're not going to trans that you're not going to traverse that valley using all of the probabilistic resources of the Earth. Oh, just one other thing. Do you think, this is very abstract, there's no doubt. It is. Is it? I, I, is I it, wondered whether I should valuable? even bring it here. What, <laughs> <laughs> what, what's, what do you think its value would be? Um, why is it even worth going that far? Is it, is it because some people have those questions? Or? I think so. I think there are people who, who make the claim that information can be developed, uh, can be obtained for free. And one of the things this is saying is there is no such thing as a free lunch. That in order to get a search that's going to make the, you have to input enough into the search to make it worthwhile. And that means that all these little random programs that they do to try to you know, do things have to assume smooth uh, functions, at least to a certain extent, and have to, ha uh, if, if, you, if you're not dealing with smooth functions, you'll get caught up in whatever local maximum you are in an evolutionary search. An evolutionary search basically is you go to a point and then you search an immediate, that immediate area and you need to pick the best point and then you search in that immediate area and you keep picking the best point and gradually, as long as you're climbing up a hill, you're fine. If you reach the top, then you stay there. Because every time you search around that spot, it's always lower than the, than the very top spot. But the problem is that if you've got a hill here and another hill over here, you can't get from this hill to that hill without going down the valley. And that's the problem. Life appears not to be arranged in a good way to uh, allow evolution to find all of the uh, variety of life that we have today. Uh, yeah, go ahead and then uh, doesn't, Ariel. Doesn't, isn't it the assumption here that um, Search space remains constant with time? Well, right there it does. Yeah. Uh, their next step, as they said, is to prove that it works even when the search space doesn't remain constant in time. Well, there are people who, for example, will say we have arms races where the cheetah gets a little faster and so the gazelles get a little faster, so the cheetah gets a little faster and the gazelles get a little faster and, and uh, pretty soon you have cheetahs and gazelles that are that are both much, much faster than they would normally be and the cheetahs can run 70 miles per hour for short distances and the gazelles can run 60 miles an hour for longer distances, but which is what we have now, which if you think about it, that's fast. But if the search space is reduced, then probabilities go up. If there's a natural selection process that reduces the search space, then the probabilities of the events that do occur within that search space will naturally go up. Uh, the point is not that evolution will not work for anything. Evolution will work very well for maintaining stasis if you find a nice hill. And conceivably, if, you, if circumstances change the hill, then evolution might follow them. Yeah, well but the problem that you'll have is 
can you get to the next hill? How far away is the next hill? And that's the real problem. Well, if, the, if the next there are algorithms that allow you to search through minima and reach and find, uh, you know, that. Is uh, that a random variations in natural selection? Well, algorithm? that's the, that's the the issue. Does it apply to that? But we don't know. Well, that's that's the point, and I think that's the point we have to look at: is does biological reality correspond to the kinds of artificial constructs that have been put up? and saying, yes, we can do this with a standard evolutionary search. Yeah, so there's a lot of assumptions here under there, this model that one has to consider in making a conclusion about whether it applies to evolution effectively or not. Now, I think that one could argue that if evolution were to work, then it would require an, an extremely designed universe and perhaps one that uh, even uh, a designed you know, because once you get life, then you have to get the next level, and you have to get the next level, and you have to get the next level, and eventually you have to get to people, because we're here. Uh, Ariel. Just a uh, comment in connection with the previous uh, uh, speaker, sub-previous, <laughs> about the... Uh, uh, X sub i minus 1 and X sub i minus 2. Well, <laughs> <laughs> there has been a school of thought, and evolution uh, sometimes went under the name of emergent evolution, where it was uh, patently stated, the sum is more than the total of the parts. It's uh, an optimistic approach. It is a totally non-quantitative approach. Uh, and I thought more or less that that idea was uh, forgotten. Uh, but I saw it you know, a year ago, I remember, saying, they were going right back to the same thing. Hey, uh, when you get all these things together, you've got an entirely different thing. We don't know what it is, but it's, it works, obviously, because evolution has occurred. Uh, Which, of course, is begging the question, if you think about totally, it. Totally, totally begging the question, totally non-quantitative. Uh, but it gives you an answer for people who ask you what's going on. Well, yeah. We're here. The, evolution did it. Therefore, evolution the can total, do this. The total is worth more than the sum of the parts. Uh, there's something that works special in there. Well, I, in fact, most of us believe that in a certain sense. If you were to take the sum of our parts, we're probably worth about $2. If we, take, if we don't break us down completely, we're worth probably, um, I don't know, maybe a couple hundred dollars if you know, refine the insulin out and use it and so forth. Um, but, but humans are worth a whole lot more than, uh, than, than alive than they are dead. Uh, well, maybe with the exception of Hitler. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, it's, uh, we have a comment back here. So if I made it through all that right, basically I have a rigorous argument against those that argued against irre irreducible machines that your hills and your valleys, your valleys are what make the irreducible machines. You can't get there from here. And then that the arguments made that you can Basically, they were making the arguments back again on a rigorous mathematical basis that, no, you can't. You cannot get more information into the system randomly. That's pretty much true. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, we haven't gone into the special case of whether, uh, whether this particular type of search is useful in this particular landscape. Um, and that's the one weakness of this approach. But I think it does argue that you just, you know, th throwing things up and see where they come down is not going to work. And most people instinctively know that. The, the reason that a tornado in a junkyard doesn't produce 747s is, you know, uh, <laughs> you just don't throw stuff together and, 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 and see it uh, come into something that's functional. And I think this 
the uh, the quote that if I hear one more time that if I find a clock in the desert, it does, I naturally think of design as opposed to random chance and the person that said, I hate hearing that. And it's because intuitively it makes sense and most people can understand that, but we can play mental gyrations around that mathematically and try and prove otherwise. They have done the case of playing the mental gyrations back again, saying no, you can't get around the common sense of that fact. Yeah. Uh, they think that they have constructed a way in which it can happen. And it's true that if their construct works, it will happen. The question is, is that the way biology is made? And I think that's the fundamental point that has to be hammered. And the way it looks like now, doesn't look like it. Where we have tested it, it has failed unequivocally. Uh, in one particular area, it needs to be tested in other areas to see whether it similarly fails. But if it keeps failing, at some point you have to say, you know, this is not a viable model that actually models the way biology is today. Uh, comment back. Information is precious. Information is precious? Yes. And a, a comment down here, it looks like. Um, Do they uh, get into anything s s or demonstrating or showing or even discussing how they would define what additional information or creation of information would be so that in their, when they're putting out their, their matrix, you know, and you have 10,000 cups with 10,000 Ps under them, you know, what would constitute 10,001? If you start with 10,000, what would get you that additional point on the matrix? So if you had a trap door under some of the cups and you lift the cup and the P falls out, is that an Well, additional? I think that the idea that they have is this, that as you get closer and closer to the green peas, which are the actual ones that grow, that the peas get just a little bit more green. And so if you look at this one and um, then look at all the ones around it, you say, well, that one's greener. So then let's go over to this one and look at the ones around it. And then, and then you keep going. And eventually, you'll get uh, to the, where the peas are totally green. And, and, and that's your final answer. And uh, that's, uh, you know, it's like the Easter egg game where, you know, warmer, warmer, colder, and the colder you turn around and go the other way. So it's all process elimination. Yeah. And as long as you have enough time to, to, to go warmer in the appropriate number of steps, eventually you'll get there. But that assumes that there is something that says warmer, warmer. And the only thing we know of that says warmer, warmer is that you can produce more babies that actually live. And the problem is that you go from two babies to 2.1 babies. It, you know, how, how much does that really, you know, for a, high, for a large population, and, well, maybe it's a slight tendency. But then if there's a war and suddenly both sides have lost, you know, eventually there, there's so much other stuff that goes on that, that ruins the relationship. The natural selection is not sensitive enough to really be able to tell you that. It takes too long. People have calculated how long it takes and the calculations come out to be you can't expect more than one random mutation at a time. Uh, everything else has to be perfectly good. And in fact, one is stretching it. You probably won't even get one, but you're certainly not going to get two. So your search space suddenly becomes very limited. You can only go one step at a time. And that means that if it takes four steps to get underneath the valley, you know, to get across the valley, then you'll get two steps and then you'll slip back. So how do like all these viruses that are mu supposedly mutating so fast? Well, the the viruses, they uh, in bacteria, it's calculated that you probably have you probably can go six steps before you run out of them, before you before you you hit the bottom and you have to start sliding back up. Hmm. 
well, I heard that like the, the, the Ebola virus now that's doing it, they had read in the newspaper somewhere that it was like 68 variations and mutations from the previous version or something. Yeah, so. yeah. Most of them don't work as well, by the way. The Ebola virus that we have now is not as deadly as the previous versions of it. Uh, that's something that's not very well known right now. So it's really a loss of information. Is you're losing information. That, in fact, if, if we wait long enough, the Ebola virus will probably exhaust itself. Um, I don't recommend that as a, a procedure because there's <laughs> going to be a lot of people dead before that happens. Yeah. By the way, those of you who were at the meeting last night may have noticed that um, uh, there are, what, about 8,000 people that uh, certified got the virus, and there's probably double that that got the virus, but nobody knows. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, uh, and that's out of populations in the order of millions. But I thought that there were already 10,000 dead? Uh, no, 4,000 dead, at least according to what they said last night. Now, it's growing, and so those numbers, of course, as time goes on, will be out of date. But the idea is that when you think of this as being something that, you know, ha it is not like the plague where half the population of Europe died, at least not yet. It's scary because it has the potential to do that, and maybe it will do that eventually. But it's not quite, what, what is particularly scary about it is that a lot of the people who die turn out to be healthcare people. Because the people who get sick go to see the doctor. And uh, if, if things are not set up right, uh, and they have the standard hospitals over there, whereas you know everybody's in one big ward. You know, one person in that is going to infect the whole bunch. It's going to be a nightmare. Basically, you shouldn't go to see the doctor at that point. It's actually more dangerous to see the doctor than not. Well, then that could bring us back to what our um, topic, where if you examined your Ebola. Uh, fatality or something, or, or spreading based on only looking at all the healthcare workers, you might assume that it's much more out of control or much more deadly than maybe it is because it's um, actually you're, you're yeah. not searching all the, the rest of the information that you didn't realize was out there. That is true. That is true. And, uh, but when, to get back to the Ebola mutating, Ebola well, is mutating. It's not mutating to a much worse thing yet. It may. It may wind up getting to where it can come out of human, uh, uh, you know, have come out of, uh, let's say, become a respiratory virus that a little bit of cough or sneeze and people get it. Right now, it's not doing that. Um, I. I I noticed that the hazmat people still have masks on for the simple reason that I don't think they trust it and I don't blame them. If I was taking care of an Ebola patient, I'd have everything on too. <laughs> you know. But um, uh, it's not as easy as it sounds to be able to get these things to suddenly uh, 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 become uh, super bugs. So then how does a, a virus or a bacteria, when it becomes resistant to a drug, if it's had some mutations to become resistant, isn't that actually a positive or, or a gain in, in its information that it's now able to fight off this attacking it depends. mechanism? It depends. There are two kinds of of resistances. One of which is the virus, um, uh, they'll call it had sex, it, it's a transfer DNA is what it is. Because there's no sexual organs of the standard type, but the virus got a plasmid, a so smaller circle of DNA from another virus that produces, let's say, penicillinase. And if it can take that into it, then it just incorporated information. But that's information that was already in the other bug. 
So that's not actually a gain of information. It's just a transfer. Okay, and those bugs actually do pretty well. The other kind is, for example, there are antibodies that glom onto bacterial uh, ribosomes, for example, and mess them up. The ribosomes no, no longer produce the protein, or perhaps they produce the wrong kinds of proteins. They start you know, adding stuff that isn't supposed to be there or changing it or something. Um, and so you're messing up the protein manufacturing production. Uh, uh, tetracyclines, for example, will do that. Okay. Now, how a bacterium commonly becomes resistant to tetracycline is the tetracycline fits onto the ribosome in a particular area. And because our ribosomes are not the same as the bacterial ones, the tetracycline doesn't bother us in the same way. It has other effects, but it doesn't bother us in that way. And so it gloms onto the bacteria and not to us, That's, which is nice. Okay, but the problem is that the bacteria, all the bacteria has to do is to change this amino acid here, when, and now the tetracycline no longer fits. Okay. It's like, you know, like putting, uh, uh, like putting putty into the keyhole, you know. The key doesn't go in anymore. Now, the thing of it is, whenever you do that, you also change the structure of the ribosome itself a little bit. And so it doesn't produce proteins quite as efficiently. And so the way to get those organisms out of the way is very simple. You stop using tetracycline in your hospital and in the surrounding hospitals. And you wait. And pretty soon, the, the wild type outcompetes the tetracycline resistant type uh, uh, this cycle has happened two or three times with uh, Septra, for example, Bactrim, uh, sulfamethoxazole primethoprim. When it first was introduced, it was the magic cure. In fact, when it was first introduced, sulfa all by itself was a magic cure. Then you had to use sulfa with trimethoprim, and then uh, they got resistant to that, so then we stopped using it at all. And then the... Uh, the uh, Resistant organisms got out competed, and then Scepter was again in vogue for a while. And now, right now, it's kind of out. Although there are still some bugs that are sensitive. And if you take somebody and you do a culture and it says re resistant to this and this, which you were normally using, but it's sensitive to uh, sulfamethazole, tri uh, sulfamethoxazole, trimethoprim, say that fast three times. Uh, um, <coughs> then you can use that uh, uh, antibiotic and it'll cure the person of their, say, urinary tract infection. Interestingly, for some reason, Staph aureus doesn't seem to be doing that too much. And so we're still using uh, sulfamethoxazole trimethoprim to treat methicillin-resistant Staph aureus or MRSA. So it's, it's an information game all the way around. And the point is that you don't usually you don't usually gain anything extra. It has to exist somewhere. And it has and and the only place that we know of where it's created de novo is intelligence. And of course that's not really de novo, that's from intelligence. Question back here, and then I think we'll make this the last formal question. Although those of you who want to s hang around uh, are welcome to do well, so. I have several questions, but anyways, I one just what you were talking about. I mean, what about AIDS? AIDS, AIDS is just one virus, correct? I mean, is it hasn't yeah. mutated per se, or it has? Oh no, not, it's not mutated a lot. It's mutated yes. a lot. Um, okay. Uh, there's HIV one and HIV two to start, and then okay. uh, each one of those there's some forms that are resistant to. Uh, 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 various drugs, and there's there's several drugs that have been developed, and some of the forms are resistant, some of them are sensitive, and um, that's a whole science in and of itself. Uh, again, uh, mm -hmm. it seems like the resistant ones aren't quite as deadly, but the problem is that we can't stop them, and so eventually they get you anyway. Well, anyway, with the like with this example with the nurse that was uh, treating that guy that died, I guess, and and that was another thing that the 
they spent so much money. I think they spent a half a million dollars or something like that on trying to save this guy's life, and he still died. That that would be a problem too if it's that costly to even treat people. Uh, well, that's right. I mean, you uh, you take a thousand people like that, yeah. and suddenly you're <laughs> out a uh, billion dollars. Yeah, that's. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we're trying to be a little bit proactive in sending people over there to build uh, places where the Ebola patients can go and stay. Yeah, it's worth the money to avoid this the whole epidemic in the first place. But, but with the with the protocols that the, the nurse supposedly was using, then you got to look at that too. Why did she get it, and she was supposedly using all this? And well, there are people who are investigating that very much. I, I, one of the things that I think. Uh, some of the more experts uh, people are saying, and that includes the uh, speakers last night, is that probably these people should be moved to a centralized area. And in fact, they're saying that if you get it before you're having the vomiting and diarrhea and you know messing everything up, you walk into the back of an ambulance, they leave you there. I mean, you're healthy. It's not like you're going to die right now. They drive you over to wherever it is, uh, you know, um, maybe the, the place in Atlanta seems to have a pretty good record right now. Um, you walk out, you walk into the elevator, you walk into the room, and then they draw your blood and everything. That way you don't contaminate anybody else. And you get ready to stay there for however long it takes until you're not contagious anymore. But, but how would people know if they're contagious? How would well, that's, know if got it? that's a huge problem. That's a huge problem. And in fact, we faced one part of that already with the first case. See, the guy comes in, he says, yeah, I'm from Liberia. Uh, well, were you exposed to anybody with Ebola? No, no, no. Well, then you probably don't have Ebola. Let's, you know, give you some antibiotics and uh, Zofran, and you go home, and you'll be okay. Oops. And we're learning not. We're learning to be a little more careful than that. Uh, and I think that I think one of the things that's going to happen is if you're from that area, or if you've been through that area, and you get sick, you go into isolation until we know. Well, like if somebody, it's it's too easy uh, it for like ISIS. I mean, I'm sure they've got to be thinking of this. This, this is too simple. I mean, you put one person on a plane. Hey, y hey you, get, you can't You go down there, it. you collect somebody's vomit. Right, right. It's too, it's too easy. You put it here and there. Nobody knows until they're all sick. It's like a bomb going off. Oh, hey, well, but they, then you're a martyr. And then uh, see, yeah, right. you've got your That's, 72 virgins that way. Well, they can take a million people out instead of just a dozen. <laughs> they don't care about themselves. It's, you know, they're, they're looking forward to the future of, after they're gone. Uh, the 47 Virginians. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm curious uh, about this uh, vomit thing and so on. Uh, and we say that saliva is not. Supposing you have regurgitation from your stomach. Uh, the uh, answer is yes, saliva is. Okay. So you, when you sneeze. In, in fact, one of the things that they're doing in Africa now, they're not even shaking hands anymore. Well, they're doing the elbow bump, not yeah. even the fist bump. Right. Uh, so, so saliva, you, when you sneeze, you bring a level of spray. Well, that's, a, uh, that's an interesting question. Apparently, it isn't very contagious that way. For one thing, most people don't sneeze. Yeah, but you know, one, one I mean, it's, uh, but, but the, other thing, the other thing is that people who have been there and actually you know, visited those people, they're saying that they haven't seen that much transmission of that, of that side that kind. I'm not saying it couldn't possibly happen. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, that, you know, but what I'm saying is that it's extremely rare compared to everything else. Yeah. Yeah, but now, here's one of the things to keep in mind. If Ebola is around, there is no way of guaranteeing that you cannot get 
Yeah, well, I think and that's something careful. that we have to get used to. We mm -hmm. are used to, we can guarantee that nothing will go wrong. And the fact of the matter is we can't. Exactly. For all we know, somebody's going to leave this room, drive down the freeway, and get hit by a truck. One Ebola virus can ruin your whole day. Yes, it can. <laughs> they did say, though, people have survived it, but they won't get it. That's probably true. As far as we know, there, the strains are closely enough related that you will, antibodies to one kills them all, which means that the people who have survived it, they're they're pretty much immune, and that means that those people are particularly valuable. Once they get well enough to do that, it makes perfect sense to send, let's say, a doctor who caught it back there, because now they're safe. And the same thing is true. If it's a 50% survival rate, that means 50% survive. That means there's a whole bunch of people over there who can do a lot of the care and not worry about it. So I don't think it's quite as bleak as what everybody makes out. But we've gone a, quite a ways from... Uh, uh they bumped it up to 70%. I heard the same thing. Yeah. World Health Organization, they said now it's 70% of that. Well, it's... Uh, those, those statistics are um, difficult because they depend, on, they depend on two things. Number one is what happens with time because maybe as we go on, more of them die. Uh, number, two is, number two is it's a moving target. One of the things that they're finding out is that selenium seems to give you a 15% margin on your survival rate. Nobody knows why. Nobody's even totally sure that it actually works. But it's starting to look that way. So, so the, the early ones may, may have less than the later ones. And it does make a difference how you treat it. If people give you electrolytes um, and, and something to keep them down, apparently you get a cholera-like syndrome and that's what many people die of. But if you can keep replenishing the fluids, um, there's more of them that actually survive. So like I say, it's a moving target. And um, I would take all of the numbers you get with a grain of salt. Even if they're totally accurate, they're likely to be outdated uh, in the next few weeks. And even if they are carefully collected, they're not necessarily totally uh, accurate. There are apparently people who, you know, get a little stomach upset and, and that's the end of it and, um, and come to find out they've had Ebola. So there's, you know, kind of subclinical. Well, th are those survivors or not? And how do you know which, which ones they are? Without a blood test, you don't. And those ones don't get counted in the ones that survive. But they should. Uh, I'm sorry. Yes, and do we have a question up here? I was just thinking, 20 years ago, I listened to a pathologist friend of mine come back from an AIDS conference in Amsterdam, and one of the topics was if the AIDS virus mutates to where it's transmitted like the common cold, their quote was, it's the end of the human race as you currently know it, and I think that this is going to be a recurrent theme in the upcoming decades as we keep seeing more and more changes that we're sort of playing Russian roulette, waiting for that one virus that does, Ebola type virus that does mutate so that it can be transmitted like the common cold. And it reminds me of the quotation that all of creation is groaning under. Yeah. Fortunately, okay. the AIDS virus hasn't done that in the last 20 years. Well, I've simply been uh, a little amazed or surprised that they emailed these individuals from that part of the world uh, to get on a plane and fly to another area. It seems to me like it needs to be quarantined. I mean, there's some problems with that, but uh, they may have to go that far. Well, I, I think that most people are saying, no, don't get on a plane. That's stupid. 
Um, uh, not so much because everybody's going to die, but because all you have to do is transmit it to one person who may not even die. But then that person transmits it to a whole bunch of other people. And now they, th now they have to track down all the people that were in the plane that that one lady flew in. Um, because if they don't, then it's going to pop up out of nowhere in Minnesota somewhere. Um, <laughs> Let, let's just let's just say that the combination of people in general and government in particular are not always as efficient as they should be. <laughs> anyway, look forward to you. Uh, next week we'll uh, continue and uh, hope to bring something that's interesting enough to come and listen to.